Hey everybody, welcome to Sports Insider. I am Dan Lobby. He is Bud Shaw. We have a kind of packed show today. Only two guests, Chris Haynes and Mary Kay Cabot, so they're good guests. Uh, let's get right to it, Bud. Packed with quality. Yes, exactly. Quality over quantity. Uh, let's bring in Chris Haynes, our Cavaliers beat reporter. Chris, how are you? Doing fine, guys. All right, Chris, uh, the Cavaliers are just kind of waiting right now as the Toronto Raptors and Miami Heat play out their series. Uh, what impact do you think this long layoff, again, is going to have on this team, if any? Well, you know, all, all we can do is based off of recent history, and recent history shows that it, it helped. Recent history shows that it came out fresh and determined, and they put a slaughter on, on the Atlanta Hawks. So uh, I, I don't think I think they know how to play this week off. It's always a delicate balance of, you know, trying to, you know, gain reps, but also not trying to go too hard. You want to try to minimize injury risk. So I, I don't think this week off is going to be a concern at all. I think they know what to do with it. Uh, Chris, who, who poses the bigger challenge in your mind for the Cavs, the Raptors or the Heat? <sighs> you know, before the postseason started, I said Miami had the, the best shot at winning, I mean, at, you know, at defeating the, the Cavaliers, even though I still said the Cavaliers would leave them six. Uh, I don't know, but look, the, the Heat have struggled with Charlotte, then, you know, white side going down, and it looked like this series may go six or seven. Uh, I don't know. I, I don't know. I, I, think to answer, I think to answer your question the, the best way, I, I don't think either of those teams really have a shot. I, I think it's a, probably about equal right now when you take away uh, Dallas units from Toronto and white side from Miami and just the way they're kind of banged up and, and been playing so far this postseason. So, I've kind of switched it up. I, I think I think they both face a neutral challenge in that I really don't think any of those teams have a legitimate shot to take it down the Cavs. Gotcha. Chris, if there is one thing to be concerned about with this team and, and the big three as well as they've played when they've been together in the postseason is they've never really had to face a test. They've never been down in a series. They've never had to battle back in a game five or something like that. Um, does it concern you that they may not face that test until they get to the finals in a, in a matchup with one of those three teams out West? Maybe a little, but at the same time, you know, they're, they're taking care of business. I mean, if, if we, if they were tested by the likes of Detroit and Atlanta, I think everybody would think there was a problem because they should be taking care of these games and they've done that. So it's hard to criticize them for taking care of business sweeping these teams and getting these long breaks. They're just taking care of the schedule. Now, on the other end, there can be a benefit in the fact that I think we all believe and think that it's going to be a struggle out West. We've seen how the, the series was with Golden State you know, and, uh, and Portland Trailblazers. It, was five, it went five games, but it, it didn't feel like five games. It didn't look like five games. And then when it gets, gets to the Western Conference Finals, you have to think if, if, if it's OKC or – San Antonio with, against Golden State, that that's going to be a slugfest. And that has the potential to go to distance. So I think the Cavaliers will be fresh. And, uh, you know, will they have been tested? No, because I don't think they're going to get tested until they get to the final. But at the same time, I think they're taking care of business the right way. Chris, let's play a uh, little plus-minus game. When you look at Ty Lue's first uh, playoff experience so far, what has he done well, and what do you think is – has he done something that has raised your eyebrows a little bit the other way? He, he's, you could tell he's not afraid to uh, just go outside the norm and use, you know, unconventional lineups. And one thing I like about his game plan is that, you know, he didn't make an adjustment for two and a half games. Uh, he, he was like, I'm going to go in there, we're going to play and do what, I, do what we do. But he was also prepared. He had three or, three or four different options that if the Atlanta Hawks adjusted, he could switch up and, and go to those routes. And so he always talked about being prepared. And you can definitely tell in his schemes and his game plan and when he's going out there doing stuff. It, it really looks like he has the control of the team. The team is well prepared. And they know that, hey, we may go into the game initially uh, with these sets, with the knees, uh, but they're, 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 they have the mental toughness and the capacity to switch at a moment's notice, even when the game is intense and going through some adverse situations. So I've just been really impressed by how he's pushing the right buttons, 
and how he has fallback options to go on, and the whole team knows about it, and they go out there and just execute. Chris, I want to ask you a couple non-Cavs questions. First, looking at that Oklahoma City-San Antonio series, because most people have thought it's going to be the Cavs versus either the Warriors or Spurs in the finals. Well, Oklahoma City obviously has a chance to shake all that up. What happens if Oklahoma City wins that series? Do they have a real shot to get to the finals? Oh, yeah, no, no doubt. It, it was always those three teams in, in the West. I still think, you know, look, Westbrook and Kevin Durant, I'm still not sold on that blend of talent right there. I'm still not sold that they'll be able to get that final game to advance to the Western Conference Finals. Just the way they play down the stretch, they always seem to find some type of way to mess it up. With that being said, Oklahoma City is a real threat. They're a serious threat. They're a threat to Golden State. It would be a threat to Cleveland Cavaliers. But I will say this. It would be in the Cavaliers' best interest to play OKC. If OKC found a way, and they could. You know, they have the matchup. They have the personnel to give the Warriors a tough time. Uh, you know, if they got to the finals, man, I would think that the Cavaliers would be favored. And so I think uh, from people on this side of the uh, the world, or the side of states, that is, uh, I think they would favor that matchup. Have the, have the Cavs uh, uh, been so good in the postseason that you think they would also be favored in the series against the Spurs? Yeah, possibly. If, if they, look, the Miami Heat or Toronto Raptors, obviously none of those teams are on par with the Cavaliers. But definitely, if the Cavaliers took care of business just like they took care of business in the first and second round, and then you see the Spurs kind of sputter, go through a seven-game grueling series, whether it's against, uh, you know, Warriors or here in the, you know, OKC, what they're going through now, yes, I think there is a chance that the Cavaliers will be favorite over the Spurs. But if it's the Warriors, that's the only team that I don't think the Cavaliers will be favorite, regardless of the circumstances, here's the Golden State Warriors. Uh, last question before we let you go, because you did cover the Trailblazers before you came here. Um, look, they were supposed to be a lottery team this year. They end up challenging the Golden State Warriors. I mean, it was a five-game series, but it was a tough five-game series. Uh, you know, I wonder if, you know, as Steph Curry has risen, of course, Kyrie Irving had that great year last year and got a lot of attention. Uh, do you think people in some ways forgot just how good Damian Lillard is? I, I don't know if they forgot. I just think they didn't know. You know, they, they didn't know. He, he wasn't, you know, even though Portland Trailblazers have, has received some type of moderate success over the last couple of years, they don't get a lot of limelight. They don't get a lot of exposure. They don't get a lot of national TV games. And, of course, when LaMarcus Aldridge departed and went to San Antonio, you know, you know a number of people, including myself, thought they were going to be a bottom feeder team in, in the league. But I think Damian Lewis showed everybody on the grand scale. And, and plus, and don't forget, the kid was snubbed, too, an all-star. You know, he snubbed in an all-star game, and he ended up getting some votes for MVP. So, you know, they were snubbed from a whole bunch of different rounds. But, no, I think everybody right now is starting to witness and see that, okay, this, this kid is legit. Not only is he a good player, but he's showing that he can lead his team. And I, I think this is his, his wake-up kind of moment, welcome to the league kind of moment in like his fourth year. Uh, I, think, I don't think people forgot. I just think people didn't know. All right, Chris Haynes, our Cavaliers beat reporter. We know you have to get the shoot around, Chris, so we appreciate you taking the time. All right, take care, guys. Uh, yeah, you know, that Oklahoma City situation mm -hmm. is really interesting because uh, they've always been a team that I think can play with LeBron teams just because Kevin Durant is that sure. good. But and that so being Westbrook. said, yeah, Westbrook's, they, oh, Westbrook's fantastic. Now. But that being said, I think that would be the one team out west that the Cavs would absolutely be favored against. Yeah, you know, we talked going into the playoffs, I think, about how and during the course of the season, how the Spurs seemed to have a system for what yeah. they wanted to do. They run their offense. Same with the Warriors. We kept saying the Cavs really don't have one. Well, I think the Cavs have found one now in the playoffs. And I would put Oklahoma City in that category of when things get tight, <laughs> Westbrook or Duran are going to have the ball in their hand and everybody's going to stand around and watch. And we've yeah. seen that in this town before. I think that would work to the Cavs' advantage in a series. Now, and Westbrook is so good when he just is full go that no, no system is going to stop that yeah, guy. Yeah, absolutely. All right, let's switch gears and talk Browns. We bring in our Browns beat reporter, Mary Kay Cabot. Mary Kay, how are you? I'm doing great, guys. How you doing? Doing well. Mary Kay, I've been asking a, a number of people this question since it's Browns' uh, rookie minicamp weekend this weekend. Uh, take away maybe the, the more well-known guys. Is, is there a rookie that you're kind of intrigued to get some, uh, some eyeballs on this weekend? 
Yeah, you know, I wrote about uh, one today uh, in terms of uh, analytics talking about who is the best pick and who is the worst pick. And there's there's a lot of hype out there about Rashard Higgins, uh, the wide receiver from Colorado State. Uh, people just rave about him. And I went and watched uh, some highlights, uh, you know, online yesterday. And you know what? He really, ca- you know, catches the ball really well with his hands. He's got good speed. Looks like he's got great instincts. He's a big time playmaker, catches a lot of touchdown passes. And uh, he just seems like uh, somebody that, that could be headed for, for decent things this year. You know, this is such a preliminary uh, workout. You know, you, you don't really know what to make of it. What will you be interested in seeing uh, of Cody, Cody Kessler? Well, you know, I like to watch sort of the mechanical type things when I first see a quarterback. So I will be uh, watching things like footwork, agility, where do your eyes go uh, when, you know, when the ball is snapped, how does the ball come out? What is the revolution on the ball? How does the deep ball look when you're hurling it downfield? Is is there still a lot of revolution on the ball or is it wobbling its way down there? You know, there has been some talk that, you know, maybe he doesn't have the strongest arm in the world. So I will be watching for that. Uh, just, you know, in general, just, you know, moving around and decision-making and the mechanical side of it. Uh, Mary Kay, sticking with that theme, this kind of marks the, the beginning, not the beginning of the off-season program, but it really gets going this weekend because now we're going to get into OTAs after this, mandatory mini camp uh, before they take their break before training camp. Uh, so kind of staying along that theme, when guys are playing football in shorts, what else are you watching for? What, what can we tell about a football team? Well, you know, I'll tell you what. The, the first thing, and I think most of the writers are like this, we always, uh, you know, just kind of see if a guy passes the eyeball test. We've watched a lot of guys walk through the door, and it's almost like you know right away uh, if they're going to make it or not or if there's going to be some kind of a, uh, transition period that they're going to have to make. You can kind of see, uh, you know, a guy's physique. How is he, uh, what kind of shape does he come in? What, you know, does he look like a football player? So that's one of the first things, uh, you know, that you, that you try to look like. Does he fit the part and is he fitting in? And, and, you know, even when you watch them go through their, you know, agility drills, you can, you can pick up clues and see things about, uh, what a guy's capabilities are. So uh, I think those are some of the first things are just who is passing the eyeball test. Uh, with the number of wide receivers they took in the draft, I, I've got this question a couple of times in the last few weeks. Is that an indication that the guys that are on the roster at that position right now are, are in serious jeopardy? Well, yeah, I would have to think that some of them would be. Obviously, they're not going to keep all of these guys, and I know they wanted to go – for a little bit more size. So I would have to think that, uh, you know, maybe some of the smaller guys might want to uh, step up their game a little bit, you know, the, the Taylor Gabriel, the Andrew Hawkins, uh, you know. So, yeah, I think so. I think that, um, you know, there is now a surplus, but you never know. I mean, it's not an easy transition, obviously, to go from college receiver to pro receiver. And some guys that you think uh, are going to make it and be great don't work out at all. I mean, last year, the only receiver they drafted, Vince Maley, didn't even make the team. So uh, you never know how many of these guys are going to make the team. And also doing that uh, story that I did today on Richard Higgins, there's a lot of uh, criticism of Ricardo Lewis, the, the fourth-round pick uh, that they took out of Auburn. So, you know, you, you know, that's another guy to keep your eye on over these uh, next few weeks to see, you know, is he going to be able to cut it uh, or was he perhaps a reach? Uh, how concerned would you be if you were Terrell Pryor, or do you think he he's so unique that they will give him more more of a look? Well, I know that that Hugh Jackson really likes him a lot. He likes his size, he likes his speed, and he likes uh, his versatility. So, uh, if he cannot uh, necessarily think that he's going to, you know be the number one or number two receiver right away, I think there are a lot of different things that they can do with him. so i I think he's I think he's going to be okay. I mean, they can also use him as their third quarterback and save themselves a roster spot that way. So, I, you know, I hear he's having a really nice camp and that Hugh Jackson has really been very impressed with his transition, his work ethic, uh, and I still think he has a really good chance. Mary Kay, the, uh, the Hugh Jackson effect, it kind of, we kind of get to get a look at it this weekend. And, of course, again, as, as the offseason program continues, uh, we know he's more hands-on than the last coaching staff was, or at least the head coach was. What impact do you think that ultimately has on this team? 
Well, you know, Hugh has brought, you know, new energy, new life. Guys are excited again. I mean, you can you could just see that so many guys were beaten down by the end of last year, especially defensive guys. They just really didn't get along well with, with Jim O'Neill. There was not uh, a lot a lot of good energy or, or good vibes coming out of that defense last year. We heard a lot of rumblings, uh, you know, from guys like Paul Kruger and whatnot. Uh, people are excited again, and Hugh has this team believing. Now, he doesn't have the fans believing this or necessarily the media believing this yet at all, but Hugh has this team believing that they're going out there to win football games and that they will do so. These guys are not coming in here thinking anything about rebuilding, rebooting, or whatever you want to call it. Uh, he has them fired up for this season and feeling like they're going to play good football. And what they will do much better than they did in the past couple of years is that they will be more fundamentally sound. You'll see uh, better blocking schemes. You'll see them running the ball more. Uh, you will, I'm sure, see you know better tackling and things like that. You know, Mary Kay, there, there's, there is a lot of excitement and optimism about uh, a head coach who really has had one, ex one year of, <laughs> of experience and went eight and eight. Um, what is it, do you think, about Hugh Jackson that people in this town are excited about? I, I'd probably say that it, it seems to me that they haven't been as excited about a head coach since... Mm -hmm. I don't know, man. Maybe when Mangini yeah. came in the door, maybe Butch Davis. I don't know. Well, you know what? He's a people person. Hugh, Hugh Jackson is an amazing people person. He's an amazing motivator, uh, and he just has that uh, that way about him where where people kind of climb on board and and buy in. And there's a lot of that going on, like you said, amongst the fans. And, and as you guys know, this is a town uh, that wants to believe. This is a this is a town and a fan base that wants to get excited about something, the next thing. And, and that generally always happens here. And there's plenty to get excited about, you know, with you in terms of his, he, he's like a motivational speaker. Uh, and, you know, he has the, the players really on board, and I think that's, that's spreading out through the community too. Wait a second. Are you saying Pat <laughs> Shermer was not a motivational speaker? <laughs> oh my goodness you'll just um, let that one lie there i understand <laughs> yeah i'm not going to touch that one but you know i think you know what i mean i mean yeah. he i mean to a man every time we talk to a player and i've even talked to players you know kind of behind the scenes a little bit and they're saying no this is genuine like we really are jumping on the hugh jackson bandwagon they love him he's a player's coach and he has them uh, believing that he's going to bring the best out in them and the team in general. All right, Mary Kay Cabot, our Browns beat reporter. Uh, thanks for the time, Mary Kay. Thank you, guys. You know, we got to be careful what we say about Pat Sherman. He might, he might be watching. I know. He watches That's, you all the time. Could, I know. You could be out you there. You have uh, quite a following. Yeah. No offense, Pat. <laughs> You're a good guy. All right. Go ahead, bud. Uh, you know, I think it's, it's an interesting dynamic because he has uh, – you know, Hugh Jackson really hasn't had that much success, but yet, I mean, I haven't come across one person yet that says, well, why'd they hire him, you know, or, <laughs> or what, you know, he's not going to make much of a difference. I, I think people are genuinely jazzed about it. Now, it's easier, again, to be excited in May and June and July and yeah. sometimes August, and then reality sets in. So it'll be interesting to see what kind of patience people show with with this whole program and with him as a head coach, if they get out to that traditional, you know, <laughs> two and six record or one and five or whatever it's going to be. It's easy to say that you think the Browns are going to be bad, but it's a whole lot harder to bear that when yeah. they're actually two and ten. Yeah, it, it is. And I think they've probably bought themselves some time, um, you know, in a backward way with those free agents leaving who left and, and the fact that they, they bring in 15 new bodies. I mean, I think people are sort of resigned now to knowing that, you know, this is not going to turn around overnight. All right. You got some spinoffs for us. I do. You know, you may have heard something about this, but LeBron James finished third in the MVP voting behind Steph Curry and Kawhi Leonard. The voters made Curry a unanimous selection. Now, I'm not sure why that's a point of, of contention with some Cavs fans, but apparently it is. We hear from one here wondering where the hometown homerism was. He asks if hometown writers are so negative that not one could list LeBron number one. And for effect, he says, seriously? Well, here's the real problem. Those hometown writers have cable. <laughs> they also have eyes. 
They've watched Steph Curry this year. Shap says, hey, the award doesn't mean anything anyway. It's like winning Cactus League MVP. Yeah, except it's really nothing like that at all. We're a couple more playoff series away from a rematch that you better believe Cavs players desperately want. Curry, Draymond Green, Klay Thompson on one side, LeBron, Kyrie Irving, Kevin Love on the other. If the Cavs win, and that's certainly a real possibility, it'll mean they beat a team that won a record 73 games and a team with the unanimous MVP. Better yet, a Cavs win could give fans ammunition to argue that it should be their second after injury sabotaged their effort against Golden State a year ago. After 52 years without a title, you'd get to pretend that this one is worth two. It's okay to respect Curry's and LeBron's greatness at the same time, says our next commenter, to which I would say, careful now. A sentiment like that could get you drummed out of the comment section. Really now, are hometown commenters so negative that not more than one sees it that way? Seriously? Dan? Yeah, that last guy, come on, you're allowed to enjoy Steph Curry and That's, also think LeBron James is I was, a great I did a, a radio show this week, and, and I was trying to make that point, and someone said, well, you, where'd you grow up? I said, Philadelphia. They said, well, so who did you hate? I said, the Dallas Cowboys. And they said, are you telling me you didn't hate Roger Staubach? And I'm like, no, I mean, it's sure I hated the, the Cowboys, but I wouldn't have argued at the time that Roman Gabriel was <laughs> – you know, better than Roger Staubach in that one season when Staubach was fantastic. So that's all I'm saying. You, you don't, you can appreciate Curry, Akron kid, right? Yeah, two years, <laughs> two years in a row. I do want to point out two years yeah, in a row. I mean, that's that, all. Uh, I, I think fans, I understand that fans want a title. Some don't want to see the Golden State Warriors in the finals for fear that that title will be, you know, uh, kept from them again. But I can't imagine a greater matchup right now. After what happened last year, after what Curry has done this year, after what Golden State has done, if the Cavs take that team down, I won't go as far as to say that it's one of the big upsets because we know any team with LeBron James is, is going to be really good. But I just think it, it has a chance to go down even more historically, if that makes any sense, than, yeah. than, than a title over the Oklahoma City. We've wanted right. a rival for LeBron for so long, too. And yeah. Maybe finally, at age 31, one has finally emerged again. Two guys from Akron dominating the MVP <laughs> voting two years in a row. Who'd have thunk it? 3 3 0. All right. By the way, Steph Curry, too, was born uh, eight years to the day after I was in Akron. Is that so, right? Yeah. Wow. No, well, there's a. Uh, there's fun trivia fact. that you will never use, ever. <laughs> All right. Thanks to Chris Haynes, Mary Kay Cabot, and Bud Shaw. I'm Dan Lobby. Thanks for watching. I didn't think.